Hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining us online this afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you're watching from. Uh, for our celebration and conversation with Kyle, Lucia Wu, Pikshuan Feng, Tikira, Mahialani, Madin, and Yin Yi. We are so, so thrilled to have Kyle here with us to celebrate her debut novel, Win Me Something. My name is Lily Philpott. I'm the programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event space. A quick visual description of me. I have short black hair, round glasses with black frames. I'm wearing a brown top and a big silver necklace. And behind me, you can see a number of paintings and my bookshelves. Please do say hi if you haven't already. Let us know in the chat where you're watching from. I am speaking to you today from Brooklyn, New York on ancestral and unceded Munsei Lenape and Canarsie lands. For those of you who are new to the AAWW, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated, dedicated excuse me, to uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. We hold frequent readings and conversations like this one, organize community arts programming in New York City high schools and senior centers, run fellowship programs for emerging writers of color, and publish an award-winning online literary magazine, The Margins. This year, we are celebrating our 30th anniversary with a campaign we launched in October called AAWW at 30. AAWW at 30 will explore the values and ideas that lie at the heart of the workshop's mission. From the need for an artistic home to interrogating our editorial and archival legacies, this campaign will serve not only as a retrospective of our rich and layered history, but also a resounding call to envision our future. Programs like this wouldn't be possible without the support of our community. We hope you'll join us in supporting many more years of the workshop and all of our programs at the link in the, in the Zoom chat, and that you'll join us online as we continue to celebrate this fall. You can also visit aaww.org or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, where the recording of this event will be posted. During the event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. We will open our event with a reading from Win Me Something. I will introduce Kyle, Pikshwen, Tikira, and Yini briefly, and then we'll turn the mic over to Kyle. Kyle Lucia Wu is the author of the debut novel, Win Me Something. She has received the Asian American Writers Workshop Margins Fellowship and residencies from the Malay Colony, the Birdcliff Colony, Plimpton's Writing Downtown Residency, and the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center. She is the Programs and Communications Director at Pundiman and has taught creative writing at Fordham University and the New School. Tikira Mahialani Madden is a Chinese Hapa Kanaka writer, photographer, and amateur magician. A recipient of fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, Edgebrook, Tin House, McDowell, and Yado, where she was awarded the Linda Collins Endowed Residency Award. She serves as the founding editor-in-chief of No Tokens, a magazine of literature and art. She is the author of the 2019 New York Times Editor's Choice Memoir, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, which is being developed as a feature film. A finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, John Leonard Prize, and the winner of the 2021 Judith A. Markowitz Lambda Literary Award, she's facilitated writing workshops for homeless and formerly incarcerated individuals and teaches in the Department of English at the College of Charleston, South Carolina. Hick Xuan Feng is a Canadian writer and artist living in New York City. Her first book, Ghost Forest, was released in 2021. She has received fellowships and residencies from the Asian American Writers Workshop, Kundiman, the Malay Colony, and Story Knife. She has an MFA in Fine Art from the School of Visual Arts and a BA from Brown University. And Yin Yi is the author of Dream of the Divided Field, uh, which is forthcoming in 2022, and The Year of Blue Water, winner of the 2018 Yale Series of Younger Poets Prize and finalist for the 2020 Lambda Literary Award in Transgender Poetry and one of 2019's Best Poetry Books by the New York Public Library. Currently, he is the poetry editor at Foundry, gives creative advice at the reading and teaches poetry at large. 
Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our writers for joining us this afternoon. And please do join me in welcoming Kyle on screen to read. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Lily, and everyone at the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, the workshop was such an incredibly formative place for me and still is, but especially when I was a young writer. So I'm really excited to be here and so happy to have T. Kiara and Pikshuan and Yingyi, who are all just my greatest writing mentors and friends, and I'm so grateful they're all here. Um, so I'm going to begin with a short reading from my novel. I'm going to read from a flashback section. Um, <laughs> I was 14 and it was Tuesday night at Jack's Asian Delicacies. Fried banana ice cream was $2, pot stickers were three, and my mom had guilted me into coming here with her and her husband for discount Asian food. A red-haired waiter walked over to tell us the specials. The last one is baby Taiko, he said. It's baby octopus, five pieces, $6.95. It's actually taco, Ray said after he left. They had it a few weeks ago. I was going to tell him, but that's not my job. I knew that too, but didn't say it. My dad had ordered them for us before. I didn't want Ray to know that I liked them. Did you know octopuses have nine brains? I said instead, more to my mom. Sure I did, he said from the other side of her. Really? I took my chopsticks from their paper sleeve and broke them apart. You knew that? That's why I like them, he said. I eat them and get smarter with each meal. It probably means we shouldn't eat them. No one is making you, he said. And I quieted down because I did want to eat them, even if they had nine brains. I liked their firm, soft texture and the blackened tentacles, their egg-shaped he egg heads without crunchy skulls. But at least I wanted to eat them despite their nine brains, not because of them. Where did you learn that, Willa? In school today, my mom asked. Um, no. I felt like she was three beats slower than the conversation, asking about things only when I was over talking about them, missing whatever subtext simmered beneath the sentences. But she looked at me and my eye sockets twinged. By the way, what time did you get in last night? She said to Ray. My mom was a nurse and worked night shifts a lot. Ray was a security guard, so sometimes he did too. She'd started seeing him when I was at the tail end of middle school. I'd never thought of her as lonely or romantic or dateable. She was my parent. But suddenly she was red-lipped and stinging my eyes with perfume, all high-pitched laughter and quiet nods, buying gauzy, lacy clothes and washing her hair all the time. She was cleaning corners of the house we'd let pile up and lighting candles on the dinner table. She thought I needed to get out more. It seemed like an eternity since it had been just my mom and me. We were sitting at the sushi bar in front of the lone Asian employee who wore a scarf folded over his forehead and bowed when presenting dishes. I put my chin in my hand and picked up my chopsticks, tapped them lightly on the plate. Our server dropped off crab rangoon and a beer. My mom was on call, so she drank water. I didn't know why she had insisted I come. We used to go out every so often for tacos or Italian food, but Ray only liked this place, Jack's Asian Delicacies. There weren't many culture specific Asian restaurants near us, nothing exclusively Thai or Korean or Japanese. There were only restaurants that served all of the above, sushi and kimchi and sesame chicken and called themselves Asian. Ray was white like boiled potatoes cut into quarters, white like flour that sticks to skin, but he was also obsessed with pad thai and sweet and sour soup, and his hair was like mine, close enough to black that everyone called it that. That was one reason I didn't like him. When I was with him and my mom, people assumed I was his before being told I was hers. Secretly, I love Jack's too. At school, everything that touched my lips was pre-planned to make me dissolve into the background. 
I ate the pizza we got on Fridays with red sugared sauce, potato chips from the vending machine that shredded the roof of my mouth, and cold wraps with chicken and cheese and lettuce that was more air than leaf. I wouldn't be caught dead with something that needed soy sauce. I couldn't have been less remarkable, couldn't have called for less attention, but still that kind always came from kids at school, from teachers, from parents, from strangers. They told me how my eyes looked like almonds or how my skin was olive, which never made sense to me, weren't olives black or green. They compared me to something sweet, caramel, honey, butterscotch, and after a while I felt like them, sticky. It made me hold onto my arms tightly, protectively when I was in public, because sometimes as they contemplated me, they ran a finger across my skin as if they could swipe up some of the taste, as if they were testing out the texture. How would it feel to take a scoop? It was enough to turn me off sweetness forever. Thank you. Um, and I also, I'm sorry, I forgot to do a description of myself for accessibility. So um, I have long black hair and I'm wearing little gold hoop earrings with white triangle beads and a cream colored embroidered top. And I am in a hotel room. So I have a flowered headboard behind me and I'm sitting on the bed, but I don't know if you can tell that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. That was such a beautiful reading. And I always love how sensory your prose is. Um, oh yeah, I'm Pik Xuan Feng. A visual description of me is I have long black hair. I'm wearing purple glasses and a light brown sweater. And behind me is a turquoise painted wall. So I would love to start by asking you about the evolution of this book, because I know it began as a linked short story collection. And I was wondering if you could talk about how it evolved into a novel and how you went about expanding certain threads and also cutting out other threads. Yes, thank you so much, Pikshwan, for that question. So yeah, I began writing this novel when I was in graduate school, and I really began just by wanting to write a story about Willa, like I began with the character. And so um, there were so many other moments in her life that I kind of wanted to explore. Um, so at some point, the nanny, the present day section, which is when Will is working as a nanny, was really just one part of the story. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to visit her in different times of her life because I really wanted to think about just the effect and the imprint that you know the past has on the present and what kind of things you carry around um, or avoid or have to reckon with later. Um, and as I was working on it, you know, I, I really thought that because for me, like the pulse of the book was Willa's relationship with her family. Um, I thought that the nanny section really made sense because when Willa is obviously within this house, you know, interacting so closely with these with these members of a family, I thought it made sense that it would be really hard for her not to be reminded of her own family and her own childhood and that it would be a way that she kind of couldn't look away in the same way when maybe Willow was working at a coffee shop or a bar, you know, there wouldn't be these obvious reflections. Um, and because she's still, you know, in her early 20s, sometimes we just put things off for a while before we have to deal with them, you know, but I felt like her being in this section, being in this place, she kind of wouldn't be able to look away. And I liked the, the tension between that. Um, but even when I swelled that to be more of a novel and I swelled that to, to take up so much narrative. And part of that was also because I couldn't end it as a, as a story, you know, as a neat story. Um, I was really writing a linked collection because I just didn't know how to write a novel yet. It wasn't like a perfectly structured linked collection or anything. I just could never finish how to end the stories. Um, but even then I did take out other threads and other timelines um, because I, I just had to learn how to be really um, clear about which part of Willa's story I thought was most important. And for me, it was family. So I tried to take away some of the things that were, um, you know, maybe complemented her story, but weren't the main focus because I wanted it to be more, have more clarity. Hi, 
Hi, Kyle. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, a visual description. Uh, my name is Tikira Mahelani. Um, I am wearing a floral shirt to celebrate this book, Win Me Something, and polka dot frame glasses. I have long black hair, and there is a clock radio and some books behind me. Um, thank you for that beautiful reading and that beautiful answer. I want to, I also want to talk a little bit about process. Um, I've been lucky enough to have conversations with you through several years of writing this book and revising and trying to shop this book. Um, I found something that you said in an interview in the OCR, and I'll quote you here. It was a long journey and at times a devastating experience. Agents would say things like, I didn't really connect with her or I didn't identify with her, but the whole book is about how people can't identify with Willa. So they were hitting on the problem within the book. When you're younger and starting out, there's a lot of myths in your head about success and easy paths, and you hope you'll go that way rather than the ordinary way. I certainly had times after being rejected by every agent where I felt discouraged and thought I'm done. I'm not working on this anymore. So my question to you now that we're here mm -hmm. and your book has found its perfect home and it's now in the hands of, of others who can care for it. Um, did you, I guess, how do we, how do you remain faithful to a project and to Willa? You said it began with her, it began with this character. Um, the book so beautifully also steps outside um, a Western plot arc tradition. And I wondered, as you were facing this resistance or rejection, did you ever feel that you had to conform to that Western idea of plot? There are certainly ways we could imagine this could have easily gone in different directions, but you remained faithful to this kind of experiential, nuanced story about a person. So how did you remain faithful to your vision and to Willa as a character? Thank you. That's such a um, great question, T. Kira. Um, I think that part of the answer is that I did feel pressured and at times I tried, you know, almost, like I think that part of what I learned over so many years of writing this book was how to really trust my own instincts um, because there were definitely times when I received feedback in workshops or from, you know, agents or editors that really made me want to you know, try and make this book into something that someone would want to read because I didn't really have that much faith in at so many periods that anyone would want to read it. Um, and I mean, I really did write like other timelines, you know, like I, I remember a big thing people would say to me in graduate school was that it wasn't believable that Willa had no friends. And at one point in graduate school, I tried to make like a big a timeline of her having another friend, even though I felt like really certain I was like I've had no friends you know it's not that like this th this exists you know people can have no friends um but I never felt right about it but I was doing it because I didn't know how to not I didn't know how to feel right about something and really trust my own instincts in it but I of course ended up throwing those parts away because they really weren't true to the book and so this book definitely had many variations in which I added things that I thought might help but I didn't feel right about them so part of it was just me kind of learning that I had to you know learn to trust my own instincts and that someone else's vision wouldn't feel right in the book um I think that part of it was definitely like external support I mean there was definitely a, one of the times when I didn't want to write the book anymore was right before I got the fellowship the Asian American Writers Workshop and I had stopped writing for months before I got the call that I got the fellowship. And that was one of the things that really brought me back into working on it. It was really important to me because at that point, I just felt like no one would ever understand the book. You know, I didn't feel like there was an audience. And um, I mean, there's a, there's a way in which you, you need to have faith yourself, but you can't understate how important it is to have like people around you who are supporting you as well, you know? So that was really important to me that I had not just the fellowship, but that I met other people who would want to read the book or who would offer me support. Um, 
But I think all along, you know, I was kind of unable to write other stories while I was working on the novel. I think that somewhere inside of me, I just felt like I really wanted to tell the story. And I didn't really lose, I did lose faith that there was an audience out there, but I didn't lose faith in Willa, if that makes sense. I felt like she was a valuable character. And I felt like there was someone out there who would get Willa. Um, so even when I felt like maybe this project isn't going to make it to that final form of a book. I always felt that, you know, I always felt that there would be someone out there who would understand Willa. And I think that's what helped me through. Well, that was also such a beautiful answer because I feel like just, you know, speaking of the margin fellowship of, of being part of it with you, I remember you talking about the manuscripts, like, around that time and being like, I'm not, I mean, I'm writing it, but I'm not sure it's, I, yeah, I really remember those brunches and stuff that we had when, yeah, a lot of the work of keeping faith happens to involve food as well, <laughs> like having food with friends. Um, so um, the previous question actually made me think of kind of a two-part-ish question um, that's kind of related to one of the questions that I will ask you. Um, but I was curious about, because your novel, oh, sorry, by the way, I'm Yin Yi, and <laughs> I have a visual description. Um, I have short hair and uh, short black hair. I'm Asian, and um, I have glasses with black rims that are slightly round, and I'm wearing a navy wool sweater with a little shirt underneath it. You can't really see that much. And um, I'm in a room with a sloped ceiling, which I think is always kind of fun to mention. No. Okay. A little slower. I'm sorry, I'm an Aries. Um, so I was thinking, uh, I had this question around, because the way that you decided to structure your novel is not necessarily like a straight narrative, um, I was curious about how did you choose the segments and sequences that you chose? And then I was also curious about this kind of like interesting thing that happens in the book where you have these two characters, um, Natalie and Willa, who are both watchers and watching each other in many different ways. And I was curious about how you thought about developing that particular um, tension just between these two characters and how they do very similar things, but with different kind of power dynamics. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so I think your first question was about this, the sequence. So um, yeah, so I mean, I spent a lot of time rearranging the, the book because like I said, it started out in, you know, different versions. There was a time when it was, when I had it straight chronologically or even like, you know, where I was just always moving sections around, but I, but I wanted the present day to be like more of the full, the full story that kind of, um, that made sense as the present. Um, and so I did the, you know, the flashbacks in this, in the final version end up being a little trimmer, you know, a little shorter, more, more glimpsy, you know, than the present day narrative. Um, and I also tried to write them in a, in a little bit of a different way, just trying to channel like, you know, the age and the, you know, the, the shimmer of a memory rather than being in the present. But I think for me, I, I, I printed everything out, I put it on my floor, I rearranged a ton, and I really wanted things to make intuitive sense, but not be like directly correlated. Like I didn't want every single, um, like a poet, what a nice compliment from you. Um, <laughs> um, I really wanted them to make, you know, intuitive sense. I didn't want it to be directly like every scene where she's doing something in the present, now she's doing it in the past. Um, though, of course, sometimes there can be, you know, there can be that correlation. I wanted it to be like the way you as a person can be doing something and just one detail can kind of snag your head, snag your mind on a memory and something rushes forward. So I kind of wanted to channel that, the humanity of that, how Sometimes it's something very unexpected or random or mundane, and it brings forward something from your past, um, especially sometimes if you're trying to like push that past down. So I just tried to channel something, yeah, intuitive for Willa um, in the ordering. So hopefully um, I succeeded. Um, and then, yeah, to your second question about 
watching? Yeah, so I think that's such an interesting um, and observant question. You know, I think that they're both that they are they both do watch and pay attention, right? They really notice, um, but in in such different ways. And I think for Willa, she is so observant because she all because she's grown up feeling very um, you know watched in the way that lots of people who maybe grow up kind of feeling like they stick out in their setting or they're the only one they feel like constantly, you know, noticed um, or remarked upon. Um, you know, I, I certainly grew up with lots of people asking me where I was from, you know, meet like from when I was a child, people would walk up to me everywhere and ask me things about that. Or when I was really young, they would come up to my mom and ask her where she adopted me from. So I was always aware of people just like constantly noticing my presence and having questions about me, but I did notice that this never translated past the first question. You know, there was never any deeper um, curiosity about like who I was as a person, just like why I happened to be in this situation. Um, and so I think from that early, you know, if, if you feel like you're very noticed like that, you begin to feel very observant because you're feeling vigilant about when that situ situation might happen again. I think as a kid, even when I, before I understood that that was even a weird thing to happen because I didn't for a really long time, I just thought that must happen to everyone. Um, but I became really vigilant of in which situations that might happen or what kind of person would be more likely to come up to me. Um, and so I just think it, it, you know, it develops almost as a defense. If you feel like you're constantly going to have your space invaded, um, you'll be safer if you at least know when it's coming, you know? So I think for Willa, that's part of it. It's her, it's this defense she's putting up against the world, even though what she wants more than anything is for someone to talk to her in a, in, you know, in a genuine way. She also has this defense amongst people coming up to talk to her in this way she reads as ingenuine. And with Natalie, there's, you know, I, there's a lot of ambiguity because it's, you know, through Willa's eyes, but I think with Natalie, it stems more from a sense of control and wanting to have like agency over her world and the things within it and wanting to be able to arrange things a certain way. Um, and I, I don't mean that that it's a purely negative thing, but I think that there is a sense in which she wants to have she wants to know about everything that's going on. She wants to have agency over the world that she exists in. And there's obviously, like you said, such different power dynamics within those two states of watching, you know, who has the privilege to have control and who can control like who is watching them. Yeah, thank you for that beautiful answer. I feel like you capture this um, watching and being watched, but not really feeling seen so well in this book. Um, I would also love to ask you, because the cover is so beautiful with the falling flowers and the way that you describe the flowers throughout the book is stunning. Um, but I also know that flowers weren't super prominent in earlier drafts of the book. So could you talk about how um, that imagery developed and came out over time? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I um, love the cover. Shout out to Diane Chonette. Originally, the flowers actually were upright, but when we rotated them down, I liked them a lot more. That, so that was the final version. Um, so yeah, flowers were always yeah, they were always here, but they were not as prominent, like you say. It's so nice because like everyone here has read so many versions of this book. That's why their questions are so wonderful. Um, so the flowers were always there, but maybe not as prominent. And I think when I was trying to like, like I said before, how I was trimming trimming parts, you know, taking out things that I that felt extraneous, the flowers stuck out to me as something that actually weren't extraneous and maybe could be threaded in even more. Um, whereas, you know, other characters or timelines I did not think we're speaking to, you know, the thematic resonance that I wanted. Um, so with the flowers, you know, I think that flowers can be emblematic of so many things, but for Willa, they're really emblematic of her childhood and specifically her mother. Um, and I liked the idea of having flowers be this spark for her because, I mean, flowers are, you know, obviously they can be everywhere, but I think so many of us, especially in a city, we, we experience flowers like in their final form, you know, we experience them in bouquets or like vases. And um, 
in the city, obviously there's gardens, but I think the way that I always encountered flowers as a young person in the city was in the bodegas and buckets in front of the bodegas. And that's where you see, you know, the most flowers. But for Willa, um, for Willa's mother, like the way that her mother's uh, memories of gardening are tied to her is really in more of that messy early stage of flowers and growth so I always tried to make sure it was tied to her mother having like dirt on her hands and soil and her fingers and like you know planting these things that weren't necessarily like perfect and pink um, you know the way that we would see them arranged but in that um, yeah that messy dirty stage of you know early growth um, and, you know, I did, I didn't think of this book as a coming of age book originally until someone said it. And then I thought that, yeah, of course, it's a coming of age book. She's just coming of age a little bit later than that title maybe used to imply. Um, and I think the book is so much about growth. And I liked having this question in it with the flowers to me, um, though I know it's somewhat subtle, but of like what stages of growth are the most visible to us as a society and you know does that make what stages of growth are valuable outside of maybe what's most visible um so i i guess that's why i liked having the flowers started through that's so beautiful kyle i could i don't know i want to read whole essays about the flowers in this book like a whole dissertation and the petals and the way flowers and plants represent destruction and growth too. Um, I think it's related to my question, which is for me, uh, food is such a character in this book. Uh, food functions in so many ways. It's an anchor in your timelines. Um, food is tethered to each character. Food represents uh, the taking care and also receiving care. And it's it's used in such a beautiful way to pivot us back and forth through time um, and to, to, I don't know, create that movement. I was also thinking about food in terms of race and culture of what Willa knows and what Willa does not yet know. And I'm curious when you, when you figured out that that seemed really key to this book or if you had that moment or perhaps it just kind of appeared there on the page for you, but when did you decide that it would be so central to this story? I think that, um, thank you for that question. Love talking about food with you. Um, I, I think that it may have always been there, but I felt that it was important for, you know, a few different reasons. Um, you know, and one, I just think that the act, like you said, like the act that you said of food, of cooking, of sharing meals, you know, it's, it's this really elemental way of, you know, being with loved ones and what happens, you know, in a family. And so I think that there's this idea of in a normal family, you sit down and you have dinner every night or you're, or you're cooking, you know, with your parents. And it almost doesn't matter if that is everyone's experience of family, because I think that's the representation of what everyone experiences. And so I thought that that would be something that, you know, kind of immediately makes Willow feel alienated because she doesn't have this um, experience growing up, but she thinks that everyone else does. And because of that, she, you know, maybe she, she doesn't know how to cook, um, which is this big thing in the book. And you can very much in a city not cook, you know, you can just do takeout, you can go out. Um, it's not, it's very easy, but, and so she can kind of be like, okay, it's okay that I don't know how to cook who cooks but then you know when she gets this job it's like there's this nine-year-old girl who is much more adept at doing things in the kitchen that she is and it's kind of a, just another reminder of how she wasn't she didn't have this um this essential skill that is so basic you know just how to um how to provide sustenance for yourself and it feels even though that wouldn't immediately stick out to others in this way i think she thinks of it as like a reminder that that was this part of her family that she didn't that she didn't have um and then i think that the other thing that's really important that i think this is probably where it started is just that being you know being asian american i think food can be a really weighty thing growing up especially if you grow up in a mostly white town like willa um where so many Asian Americans have these stories of being, you know, 
tormented or ostracized for their food, whether the food they eat or just that they're maybe expected to eat. And then there's this whiplash effect of growing older and the food is now super trendy and being appropriated by someone not of your ethnicity. And, you know, what is it like to see these things that, you know, were ostracized now be cool if someone from a different you know, culture takes them on and elevates them or changes them, elevates in quotes, you know. Um, and, you know, what is it like to suddenly feel like you actually don't even have a connection to this food of your culture because you were so ostracized for it, but then all these other people have like taken it on and sold it as theirs. Um, and food is such an obvious connector to our culture, but Willa mentions, you know, she grows up so one, and one of the things, and I think this ties into like the biracial identity thing is there's there's the interesting conversation about being biracial, but being raised by like a monoracial parent. And, you know, Willow wonders like, would it be different if she grew up with the parent who like was used to Asian food or ate Asian food? What is it like that she's seen as this ethnicity, but she doesn't feel like she has the connection to her, to her heritage that, um, anything can provide, but food is often, you know, one of the one of those links that we have. So it's yet another way in which she feels kind of, yeah, alienated from these things about herself. That was so many rambling answers, but I feel like there's a lot of things. That was a beautiful answer. Um, I hope anyone in the audience who hasn't read this yet, you're in for a real treat and it will really make you hungry as you read. But yeah, those those scenes are what strikes strike me so much when I think about your book and even the scene with like the father and the tripe, like it just, there's so much story in those scenes around the table. Um, thank you so much. Oh, and I promised I would tell you your soup today. Are yeah, I said, yeah, please do, please do. <laughs> I think maybe, okay, so Kyle asked what soup I thought win me something could be. And I think maybe it's hot and sour soup because of the dried lily flowers in the soup and the egg in the soup. And I was overthinking of like, is this Willa's past, present and future in a single soup? I'm not sure, but we can talk about it. What oh do you think God. of that? I love it also because I love to make hot and sour soup. Actually, it's one of the things I feel okay. like I'm really good at making, um, but you're right because the egg and the flour, beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kyle, I think that it, it actually could be the first dish that you make on your cooking show that I've been trying to um, get you to do. Um, I don't know how to make hot and sour soup, and now I definitely want some. So I just feel like this this will be a hit with at least one person, me. It's actually very <laughs> simple. You just need the Fuchsia Dunlop cookbook. But yeah, I'll add this to my cooking show. Oh my gosh, Fuchsia. Um, I actually think that the question I'm going to ask, it's, I'm going to ask you about your title, and it kind of feels very related to um, this question that Dikira just added or asked you about food, because um, the place where the where Win Me Something shows up in the book, I guess maybe a mild spoiler alert, happens around a misconnection with um, Willa and Willa's mother, and there's a picnic involved. And Willa's mother has misremembered something about Willa's schedule and just created a surprise picnic for her, but it's like scheduled on the wrong day. And at the end, towards at the end, okay, I'm not really summarizing it very well, but at the end, she says, win me something to Willa. And I was just thinking about like, how did you did how did you choose that title for the book? Because there are a couple of different places where it resonates with, um, definitely scene-wise. Um, but I, I was wondering, did you kind of look at that scene and see it as kind of a microcosm of the larger narrative of the, of the book? Um, or was there kind of just, there's something in there that um, about being chosen and, and wanting to win something um, that you were also trying to express. So I'll let you answer that. Yeah, no, that was a great summary. You need to do clip notes. Um, so I think that to your answer, your question about, you know, was that scene a microcosm? I actually think when you were saying that, it kind of reminds me of, you know, of the the epigraph from my book, which is from Yimmy's The Year of Blue Water. <laughs> and it's it seems so selfish to want to be known. And I think that I chose this as the epigraph because I, I wanted to kind of explore it as a question. And I think that in the way of what, what does it represent that, you know, there's been a mis- 
miscommunication. So Willa cannot win this thing that her mother um, is wishing her to is that is, you know, the question of like, what do you give up by not being maybe truthful or genuine or known, you know, Willa thinks she's doing the right thing um, by, you know, misrepresenting something and, um, you know, maybe shrinking this desire that she has, however small, you know, this is a childhood memory, um, but what does she lose by, by shrinking that desire of herself in the service of someone else, even if it's someone, you know, that she obviously loves. Um, and with this line, I, I, it was, it's been the title really the whole time that I've been writing this book. I always liked it as a title for like a few different reasons. You know, I like that it sounds active, but it's actually passive, you know, like it sounds like a command, but it's not a command you really get to be involved in. And I was just interested in, I felt like there were different questions that it opened up, you know, like if it's about if it's win me something, you know, who is playing the game and who gets to play the game? What does it mean, you know, to win something without having experienced the game maybe? You know, what does it mean to get to the end and not have, you know, been there? I just felt like there were all these different questions about who gets to be like on the playing field and what it means to, to do so. Um, so I liked it as a title ultimately because I felt like there was maybe different interpretations and different ways that it could open up. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you all so much. Um, I am gonna transition us quickly into audience Q&A. So to those of you watching, if you have a question for Kyle, please do add it to the Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the first question I'm gonna ask is there's a question from Bonnie. Uh, who asked, did you have a clear vision for the book right when you started writing or did it evolve as you wrote? And I know you've talked about this a little bit already. So I wanted to add, um, is there a moment you remember when a, a chunk of the book really came into focus and you knew it was like, that was it? Yeah, I think that I always had a clear vision of, um, you know, of character, but not a structure. Um, so I always had a clear vision of wanting to, of who I thought Willa was and what I wanted to present about her. But I think it took me some time to circle around how to do so. Um, and I can remember, I don't know if I can remember a clear time when the book came into place, but I can remember very clearly the writing of certain scenes that I found to be formative. You know, I remember writing the scene where she's at dinner with her dad um, at the Japanese restaurant. And I remember that I remember writing it so clearly and having a really clear idea of what I wanted that scene to do. Um, and I always thought that it would be like, I, I had a really clear idea of what I wanted it to represent and I saw it at the time as kind of like a crescendo in the experience of her dad. Um, and, I, and it's interesting because I, at first I wanted to write, so that scene takes place at a restaurant and at first I wanted to write it involving like a poker game, um, but it didn't end up being that way. It ended up being a restaurant. And then years and years later, I wrote another flashback that dealt with a poker game. And it was just kind of interesting because it was like it had been tucked away in my brain for like this must have been four and a half years apart um and because that flashback at the with the poker um I only wrote in my edits after I'd sold the book so I I think that I just had these clear glimpses of what I thought would maybe move the story forward um yeah and I always thought it was interesting that that recurred amazing thank you um, there is another question from uh, Aya, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, the question is, what was the process like of figuring out how to write interiority for Willa? Did you start writing her before you started writing this book specifically? And or did you have to experiment with different ways of writing her as you were tackling this book? I did actually begin writing a project with a character who had a different name that I, I see as like my earliest tries of writing Willa. Um, and, you know, I wrote an essay on Catapult that had to do with, with this experience in which I wrote kind of these short stories about a girl who was like Willa, like it was kind of like my earliest try, you know, of writing Willa. And it was actually like a kind of a short story where you saw both 
this girl, her name was Leah in this story, and then her mother, and they both had like a part. Um, but it got, I got really um, disheartening feedback for the story, so I put it away for a very long time. Um, and then when I looked back at it, I actually was like, actually, the story's not so bad. I don't know why, why it, you know, I didn't think it was like such a bad story, but no one in my workshop just understood at all why I was writing about this person. And they just, you know, there was feedback about how she wasn't special enough to kind of hold up a story. And I think I always held that in my head while I was writing her because I was like, I thought that she was special just because she existed in my head. And so I think for part, part of the reason why I never wanted, it never felt right to give her, you know, like T. Care mentioned is kind of outside of like this Western plot narrative. Part of the reason why I never wanted to give in to giving her some flashy, um, plot arc was because I felt like she didn't need to have one, like she deserved to have a story even without that. Um, but I, I did, so I did start, you know, the conception of the character much earlier, much earlier on. But I think that the interiority was always how it was now, which, you know, a lot of people point out it's very closely interior. Um, you're very much in Willa's head um, and the story very much takes place there. And I think that I felt really committed to that because Willa is someone who doesn't feel like anyone really understands her, or what's going on in her head and the way I wanted to um, the way I wanted to go about uh, illustrating that and like uh, going against that was to make an experience where the reader, you know, was kind of forced to be really close in her head and understand her in that way. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I have one more audience question that came in through the chat, and then we're going to do a little bit of a lightning round of questions to end our uh, conversation. Um, this question is, hopefully you've been able to go into bookstores and see your book out in the world on bookshelves. And the question is, um, which writers do you want your book to sit alongside and not just like alphabetically on the shelves, but who do you want your book to be in conversation with? I have gotten to go into bookstores and it's been the most fun thing. Um, I got to go into lots of bookstores in New York and sign my books and I felt so grateful and I'd like to do that here in San Francisco hopefully as well as um, who do that's a really beautiful question. I think I want my book to definitely be alongside Yin Yi and Pik Shuen and T. Kara's books for sure. Um, I feel like I have mentioned each of them at almost all of my readings, uh, all of my conversations, because they've just each been so important to me, like not just as friends, but their books um, have been, each of their books truly has been, you know, so formative to me um, while I was writing this book. So even if they were not here, I would be naming each of them. <laughs> um, and then I think, you know, as well as that, uh, the work of, you um, you know, Ruth Ozeki, I love all of Ruth Ozeki's novels. Um, I love the way that Brandon Taylor, um, Brandon Taylor's narrators are, you know, are in the world and the way he uh, gets at these ideas of, you know, his characters maybe not having access to the same kind of, uh, you know, language or, um, you know, small gestures that the rest of the world or the world that he's in does. So I feel really seen by Brandon Taylor's work. Um, I, also, I mean, I, there's a lot of poetry collections that were really important to me while writing this book. So um, Patricia Smith's, uh, I love all of Patricia Smith's poetry. Um, Tiana Clark's, I can't talk about the trees without, without talking about the blood, was really important to me while I was um, writing this, as well as uh, all of, I love Lee Young Lee's poetry and the way that uh, he gets at food. You know, I think Rose, is one of my favorite collections, but I feel like I, I just love the way that he swells food and family as well. So there would definitely be a lot of poetry on my shelf as well. Amazing, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, I know we're almost at the end of our hour. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna turn the final questions over to Pikshwan and Yin Yi and Tikira. Um, does any of you do maybe you want to go first with your lightning round question? I know we didn't actually discuss an order <laughs> while we were checking in. I can go first because I it's written in our shared Google Doc over here. And because I'm very eager to know. So Kyle, um, now that you've been able to bop around in the world doing all these readings, what has your favorite outfit been? Or if you haven't 
worn it yet, what is your favorite outfit going to be? Okay. I love this question. Um, it was so much fun to plan outfits for the book tour. I have to say just as you know, haven't gotten to leave my house really for in any significant way in so long. Um, I think my favorite outfit would have to be <laughs> the one I wore for the books or magic reading, which was this vintage dress that I bought like three days before I left at my friend Nicole's vintage store. Um, her vintage store is called shop Lola May with two Y's. Um, and uh, sh I saw her put this up on Instagram and I had been kind of like, I really want a cool outfit for my bookstore. And when I saw it, I was like, we have to go. I mean, I drove from the east side to the west side in LA, which is a really big deal if you're from LA, like to go from the east side to the west side. And I got this dress from her and she said that it was from this collection of a ballroom dancer who had like so many ballroom dresses that her husband built her an extra wing for all of her ballroom dresses and it's this gorgeous like ombre pink and purple like taffeta dress with a giant bow in the back so yes i had a long answer but it's a really cool dress <laughs> we'll find the instagram post i can go and kyle you can answer either question i have two um, I like the Stephen King references and I want to know your favorite Stephen King story. And I also want to know your favorite scene in the book, in your book. Okay. I actually don't know that much Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I guess like Carrie, I don't know. I actually don't have a good answer for that. I have read, I have read obviously the story that Will is in. I do also like Stephen King's on writing things sometimes. Um, but my favorite scene in the book, um, I think that my favorite scene would be the one, the flashback with the mom on New Year's Eve. It's like the final flashback in the book, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and my lightning round question, what's been your favorite meal and or favorite beverage, beverage while on tour? Oh, what a good question. Um, I got to go in for to dinner at Lartuzzi, which is a restaurant that I used to work at um, on when I got to New York. And it was kind of amazing um, to be there and see so many of the people I used to work with um, and have a lot of really amazing food. And like, obviously they shut down for a while during the pandemic and there was a lot of changes, but it was nice to be there because I was working there at many of the periods in which my novel was being rejected and in which I was like calling myself a writer, but not sure if I was a writer. I was working there when I got the Asian American Writers Workshop Fellowship. And I remember talking to one of my friends behind the bar and telling him about this fellowship that I had gotten interviewed for. And I really wanted to get it, but I didn't, but it just seemed so far away. And I told him about everything you could get if you got the fellowship. And he was like, wow, that really sounds like a dream. And I was like, I know it's not gonna happen. So it felt, it feels like a really kind of of like formative place because I was there while I was doing so many of the things with this book and so to get to return and have a really beautiful meal was really wonderful um and then when I was in Minneapolis I had like the greatest martini I've ever had at this um speak easy bar under a restaurant called Suki and Mimi um and it was a very simple martini but it was very delicious that sounds amazing also great. Um, we actually have five minutes left before the hour. If any, either of you have um, any other lightning round questions or just one last question to close us out. I always have more <laughs> questions is the problem. So um, my next, my, I had, I really like this question because it's to me very fun. But like, if you were a hot pot ingredient, what ingredient would you be? Oh my God, that's so- I invite funny. everyone to answer this question because it's always so interesting. My first thought was just an egg. <laughs> everyone that's answer. I don't want to think too much, like egg, okay. Yeah, I think that's really smart. I'm a fish cake because I have a little swirl in the middle. That's a good one. Inoki mushroom. Yeah. Yes, I see that. <laughs> uh, I would choose the tofu puff because I like how it absorbs all the broth. Delicious. You're not wrong. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, 
That's amazing. That is the absolute perfect last question. If you'd like to close this on, thank you so much, Yin Yi. Um, and thank you, T. Kira. Thank you, Pikshwan and Kyle. Thank you so much for joining us online. Um, thank you for this beautiful book and, and for being involved with the workshop. It is so, so wonderful to host all of you on Zoom this afternoon and really hope to have a chance next year to bring you all together in person in the actual workshop space. Um, one day will happen and um, you are all always welcome. Uh, I want to quickly make sure to thank our pro bono ASL interpreters who are amazing. Thank you, Selena, who's on screen right now, um, and Sarika, who was on screen earlier. Um, and yes, thank you to our audience as well for joining us on a Saturday to chat about this wonderful book. And thank you. This has been such a huge, huge pleasure. Um, and we can't wait to see you all again soon. Congratulations again, Kyle. So, thank so exciting. You. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Picture and Yin and Tikira. Love you so much. Thank you all. Love you. Thank, thank you. So you. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you all. Have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>